to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's science watcher is astronaut Naoko Yamazaki. Hi, thank you for having me. Here is today's lineup. Today on the leading edge, we have asteroid explorer Hayabusa 2, navigation in space. And on J Innovators, Michelle? Today I'll be introducing a Takumi or innovator who is gaining worldwide attention for new eyes on the method that he developed. So let's begin with today's science news watch, Ms. Yamazaki. A research group has succeeded in creating a human ear cartilage with IPS cells. This is the first time that a three-dimensional cartilage has been made with IPS cells. The research group was led by Professor Tsuyoshi Takato from the University of Tokyo and Professor Noriyuki Tsumaki from Kyoto University. They used human IPS cells to create about 100 cartilage clusters and placed them in three plastic tubes that were 8 millimeters in diameter. Then they bent the tubes into the shape of a human ear and implanted them under the skin of a live mouse. In about two months, the tubes dissolved and the cartilage clusters fused together to form auricular cartilage shaped like a human ear. The auricular cartilage is almost life-size and is approximately 5 centimeters large. The team is looking to begin clinical studies to verify its use in treating microtia, which is where the outer part of the ear is underdeveloped. According to the group, this is the first time that three-dimensional cartilage has been made with IPS cells. They say that the creation of nose cartilage and knee cartilage could lead to treatments for those who have suffered damage through disease or injury. And now for the leading edge. So today we are looking at Japan's asteroid explorer Hayabusa 2 and its navigation technologies. I remember how the original Hayabusa made its dramatic return in June 2010. I made a round trip into space in April of the same year. That's right. And I saw Hayabusa's return on the internet. It was very moving. It reached an unexplored asteroid and gave the world its first look at asteroid material. This was a great achievement. I was inspired by the new challenges that were tackled and the team's determination in spite of all the difficulties. Yes, Japan's asteroid explorers are some of the best in the world. Hayabusa's successor, Hayabusa 2, has set off on a new mission. Let's find out about the project. The asteroid explorer Hayabusa 2 was launched on December 3, 2014. It will take approximately six years to make a round trip and will fly 5 billion kilometers in total. Its destination is an asteroid named Ryugu. It's located roughly 300 million kilometers away and is less than one kilometer in diameter. One of Hayabusa 2's main objectives is to bring back samples of the asteroid's subsurface materials. Scientists around the world anticipate that an analysis of the samples will provide them with valuable information regarding the solar system's origins. However, the first generation Hayabusa encountered a succession of problems. The touchdown was unsuccessful. And the engine failed. Yet these experiences were used to develop new and improved technologies for Hayabusa 2. Four ion engines are attached to Hayabusa 2's rear side. They have 25% more propulsion power. A maximum of three ion engines can be used simultaneously. A re-evaluation of the internal structure led to the development of more reliable engines. 
Hayabusa 2 is expected to reach the asteroid Yugu in either June or July of 2018. This tubular sampler horn will be used to collect samples. When the tip makes contact with the asteroid's surface during touchdown, a small projectile will be fired and the dislodged material will be drawn up. Hayabusa 2 will then descend into the crater and collect samples of the dislodged subsurface materials. It will then take off from the asteroid and head back to Earth. Hayabusa 2 is scheduled to return to Earth around December 2020. So the experience gained through the problems that the first Hayabusa encountered was used to enhance and improve Hayabusa 2. Yes, the first Hayabusa was only able to bring back tiny particles. Hayabusa 2 weighs 600 kilograms and is 6 meters long. Its primary objective is to go a step further and bring a substantial amount of samples back to Earth. And to do that, it needs to first reach its destination, the asteroid Ryugu. Precisely. Please take a look at this. Ryugu is estimated to be a very small asteroid, less than one kilometer in diameter. From Earth, it looks like a tiny dot. But if you observe it closely, it appears to weave its way between other celestial bodies. So the asteroid is 300 million kilometers away and just one kilometer in diameter. The scale is very hard to picture. You could compare it to looking at a one millimeter dot on the other side of the Earth. It's hard to believe you can actually see that. So how do you reach such a small body that is so far away? First, you need to calculate the spacecraft's exact trajectory and the speed so that you could navigate it. In fact, a navigation maneuver was performed just recently. Hayabusa 2 is operated by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's facility in Kanagawa Prefecture. An orbit illustration in the facility shows Hayabusa 2's orbit path. Hayabusa 2 stayed near Earth for one year after the launch. Wasn't it supposed to head towards the asteroid? What was it doing near Earth? We spoke with the project manager, Yuichi Tsuda, and asked him why Hayabusa 2 stayed near Earth. On Earth, the fastest way to get from point A to point B would be to make a beeline from one point to the other. However, it doesn't work that way in space. For Hayabusa 2, the most effective route to the asteroid was to circle back to the Earth once and use the Earth's gravity to perform a swing by. What exactly is a swing by? And how is it done? Earth's gravity and revolution hold the key. As the spacecraft passes near Earth, it will feel the tug of Earth's gravitational field and its trajectory will be bent. And because the Earth is revolving around the Sun, the spacecraft will also be pulled by the Earth's revolution and accelerate sharply. Swingbys are easy to picture mathematically. That's why we are able to use the maneuver for actual space missions. A spacecraft's trajectory can also be changed as it accelerates. This allows it to be directed towards distant celestial bodies and makes the maneuver an indispensable part of space navigation. One year from the launch, 
Preparations for the swing by were completed. Hayabusa 2 performed a new technique. It combined the swing by with the ion engine's propulsion power. After leaving Earth, Hayabusa 2 flew in an orbit similar to Earth's. During that time, it fired its ion engines for approximately 500 hours and accelerated. The acceleration changed its trajectory and placed it in the best orbit for the swing by. And then the swing by took place. This increased the spacecraft's speed by 1.6 kilometers per second. And it simultaneously changed the spacecraft's trajectory. This was needed as the asteroid Yugu's orbit is tilted to a greater degree than Earth's orbit. The spacecraft was adjusted to Ryugu's angle during the swing by. Hayabusa 2 is now steadily making its way towards Ryugu. So the swing by was a success. Yes, it was performed on December 3rd, 2015, exactly one year from the launch. At the closest point to Earth, Hayabusa 2 was at an altitude of about 3,100 kilometers. After the spacecraft passed Earth, its flight path was carefully calculated, and the team members confirmed that it had successfully entered the orbit that would take it to the asteroid. That must have been a really exciting moment. And this is a photo that Hayabusa 2 took of Earth during the swing by. That's a great shot. The project manager Tsuda said that if Hayabusa 2 had not been on the correct path and traveling at the correct speed when it neared Earth, then Earth's strong gravitational field could have caused it to go off course. So it was a crucial point in the mission. Yes. The slightest miscalculation could have seriously affected the mission. It was a very suspenseful time for the team, and Tuda said that he was relieved that the swing by succeeded. So we saw how a swing by maneuver is used to send a spacecraft to a distant celestial body. Have other spacecraft used this technique? Yes, there is a European spacecraft Rosetta, which arrived at the comet churumov gerasimenko in 2014, and the U.S. spacecraft New Horizons, which reached Pluto after a nine-year journey. Both of these spacecraft used swing bys to reach their destinations. I see, but I heard that the swing by maneuver isn't enough for Hayabusa 2 to reach the asteroid Ryugu. That's correct. Another important technique is needed. Hayabusa 2 is currently in Ryugu's orbit and is expected to arrive at the asteroid in 2018. The small dim dot in the center is Ryugu. How will they be able to accurately get the spacecraft to such a small celestial body? We need to calculate precisely where the spacecraft is and how fast it's traveling. This is called navigation. The first step is to determine Hayabusa 2's exact location. A massive antenna in Saku City, Nagano Prefecture tracks Hayabusa 2. It is 64 meters in diameter. Radio waves are emitted from the antenna. Hayabusa 2's position is calculated by how long it takes for the radio waves to return. However, the further Hayabusa 2 goes, the more the antenna's radio waves are dispersed. This makes it difficult to pinpoint Hayabusa 2's exact location. By the time Hayabusa 2 nears the asteroid, the error margin would be about 300 kilometers. 
So a new plan was devised for Hayabusa 2. They enlisted the help of antennas around the world. The greater the antenna's diameter, the more details it can gather. By using two antennas located far apart, we can get the same accuracy as one extremely large antenna. Two antennas placed far apart can be used in the same way as one giant antenna. This makes it possible for them to find Hayabusa 2's position. Combined with a method that allows them to determine the distance, Hayabusa 2's position can be calculated with an error margin of under 3 kilometers, which is just one hundredth of what it was earlier. However, even this is not enough to guarantee that Hayabusa 2 will rendezvous with the asteroid. Because the asteroid Ryugu is so far away, the measurements taken on Earth could have an error of 200 kilometers. This would make reaching an asteroid, especially one that is less than a kilometer in diameter, extremely difficult. So a different navigation technique was developed. The spacecraft's camera will take photos of the asteroid as it moves forward. As Hayabusa 2 approaches Ryugu, it will direct its camera at the asteroid and take images. If Ryugu appears in the images, then it will confirm that Hayabusa 2 is on the right track. Hayabusa 2 will observe the asteroid on its own and measure its distance to the asteroid. This navigation technique is one of Hayabusa 2's distinctive features. This is how Hayabusa 2 will use navigation to reach Ryugu. Having gained speed with a swing by, Hayabusa 2 will continue on its voyage guided by precise information regarding its own position and that of the asteroid. So Hayabusa 2's navigation techniques are crucial for it to successfully reach the asteroid. Yes, the exact distance to the asteroid is unknown. However, an accuracy of several meters is required for the spacecraft to arrive at the asteroid. This sort of accuracy isn't possible with observations from Earth. It's incredible that Hayabusa 2 can observe the asteroid on its own and calculate its position. This technique was actually established by the first generation Hayabusa and improved for Hayabusa 2. Well, I hope Hayabusa 2 has a smooth and successful voyage. As of now, it is supposed to arrive at Ryugu around the middle of 2018. It will attempt to collect samples and return in 2020, which is when the Tokyo Olympics will be held. What do you think the future holds for asteroid exploration? Japan's first Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 are blazing a trail for asteroid exploration. I'm sure techniques like swing by and navigation will be used more often in the future. From here, the spacecraft's trajectory will need to be carefully observed and accurately calculated. If Hayabusa 2 succeeds in reaching the asteroid and bringing back samples, then we may be in for some outstanding discoveries. We visited Aomori City, Aomori Prefecture, which is in northeastern Japan. Hi, I'm Michelle. Today's report is about this. The jacket that I'm wearing is made using the traditional Japanese aizome or indigo dyeing. Conventionally, aizome was dark blue in color. But there's a person who broke new ground and created a new method to dye different shades of indigo that is gaining attention worldwide. Let's go meet him. Hello, I'm Michelle. Hello, I'm Yoshida. 
Today's Takumi or innovator is Hisayuki Yoshida. He developed a new method of aizome or indigo dyeing. Aizome is a traditional indigo dyeing method that goes back 1,300 years. The dye is commonly made by fermenting indigo leaves. Although it takes about 100 days, it produces a beautiful deep blue color. So you didn't think of using the traditional Aizome method at first? I didn't think we could compete with something that had such a long history. Yoshida and his team searched for an easier way to make dye from indigo leaves. They hit upon the idea of creating a powder out of the leaves. When I touched it, it crumbled into small pieces. And when I tried dyeing with it, it worked. Yet, this produced only pale shades. Yoshida and his team searched for a way to replace the traditional fermenting process with a chemical method. Within the dried leaves is a substance called indigo that produces the eponymous blue color. When fermented, it turns into a substance called leuco indigo. They discovered that the chemical change caused by fermentation could be achieved with food additives. Yoshida and his team spent three years experimenting with different kinds before they found the right one. Here is the dye that was made through the special method. But the traditional deep indigo blue could not be made right away with this dye. Yoshida and his team repeated the dyeing process numerous times in an attempt to produce the deep blue color. And it was during this time that they had a brainwave. They realized that if there was a way to control the process, then they'd be able to consistently produce different shades. Here are the fruits of their development. Here they are. Whoa! We can dye things in eight different colors. In eight colors? Yes. You have very pretty pastel colors too. This is a silk scarf that I brought from home. I wonder what it's going to be like. When it's dipped in the dye. Wait, it's a different color. Yes, this is the very first color. It's not blue, it's green. The green color proves that the leuco indigo is on the scarf. The shade's darkness is determined by the amount of time it spends in the dye. When the time comes, it is drawn out and placed under water. It's incredible! The color is changing! It's a totally different color! It's kind of like a science experiment! Yes, the leuco indigo oxidizes and turns into indigo when it is placed under water. It turned into a bright blue color. Your stand is team studied how long it should be soaked in dye and then in water. They then digitized the information to produce consistent results. They also worked on a way to enhance the characteristics of Aizome. Indigo contains a large amount of tryptanthrin, which is an antibacterial agent. By extracting this from the indigo and adding it in the final step, which is to fix the color, they are able to produce highly antibacterial isomer products. Zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. This quality was highly rated and astronaut Naoko Yamazaki wore clothing made from it while on a space shuttle in 2010. In addition to clothing, the Takumi wants to use this technique to develop new products. I want to develop food and housing-related products. 
I'm eager to develop new products that will promote the use of indigo. This is a shirt I wore in the Space Shuttle Discovery. It was very comfortable and the indigo color was soothing. <laughs> and I'm wearing the scarf that I made with the Takumi's instructions. I've always been under the impression that Aizome produced deep shades of blue, so I was pleasantly surprised to get such a light color. And on a side note, the Takumi only uses pesticide-free indigo plants. And I have a surprise for you. It's a cake with indigo. Indigo cake? You can eat indigo? Yes, please try some. And don't worry, indigo is good for you. And it has long been used as an herbal medicine in Asia. I didn't know that. It's really good. And the slight indigo blue color is really pretty. Mm -hmm. Yes, and indigo gives it a very pleasant flavor. And its health benefits are a nice plus. And besides food, the Takumi is looking for ways to incorporate indigo into cosmetics, wallpaper, carpets, and other household items. He also wants to zoom in on indigo's antibacterial properties and enter the medical field in the near future. It will be interesting to follow his progress and see where and how indigo is used next. If I ever get the opportunity to go to space again, then I'd like to try out more products made with this new Aizome technique. Thank you very much for your report, Michelle. So, Ms. Yamazaki, how would you conclude today's program on Hayabusa 2 and its voyage? Well, first of all, I'm very glad that the swing by was a success. Yet Hayabusa 2 still has two thirds of its journey left, and constant and precise calculations will be needed to confirm its trajectory and search for more efficient ones. I will be following its progress and hope to see it arrive at Ryugu and return safely to ours in 2020. Thank you, Ms. Yamazaki. And thank you for joining us. See you next time on Science View.